Okay, and we are live. Hey, um, so yeah, I think we I think we'll get started. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, my name's Dora, uh, Dora Hirsch. I'm the president of the University of Sheffield Jewish Students Society. Um, and today we're really fortunate to be introducing uh, Yossi Balin uh, to, as a guest speaker. Um, and we're going to have a, a, a conversation about um, his life and achievements and um, more broadly the peace process in Israel um, it, then and now and, and uh, other topics too. Um, so um, Yossi uh, is an Israeli politician and scholar. Um, he's served uh, in lots of different cabinet positions. Um, he was cabinet secretary, director of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, deputy minister of finance, ministry, minister of Econo Econo economy and planning, minister of justice and minister of religious affairs. And he was a he's been a key player in the Oslo Accords, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, together with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, he formulated the Balin Abu Mazen understandings, uh, which formed a, a potential basis for a final settlement between the Israelis and the Palestinians in the 90s. Um, and he's also been uh, a strong advocate for stronger relations between Israel and diaspora Jewry, which will be really interesting to, to discuss as well. So welcome, welcome, Yossi, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Um, I, I think I, I would like to open with, well, um, the typical age, the typical birth year of current students is between the year 2000 and 2003. So um, the, for a lot of us, this is kind of before our memory. So it would be really great if you could just tell us a bit about what, what the Oslo Accords were, what, what the circumstances around them were and why they were, why they were significant at the time. You are speaking about 2000 and 2003? Uh, I'm saying that that uh, lots of us were born after, like after all of this occurred. Yeah, that so, is yeah. a problem, but uh, okay, we have to comply with it. <laughs> yeah, so so um, lots of us don't remember, don't remember this part of history. So I'm just asking if you can um, explain to us what the Oslo Accords were and what was, what was the, the atmosphere and circumstances around them at the time. Well, actually, the relations between us and the Palestinians uh, were the, the most important and have been actually the most important uh, part of the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, because of two main reasons. One, because they are our neighbors, uh, the closest neighbors, and uh, Ramallah is, is less than half an hour from Jerusalem. And second, because if we don't uh, solve the, the issue of the relationship between us and the Palestinians, and if there is no clear border between the two peoples, then eventually it is a situation of a one, one state solution. It is not a solution, it is a one state uh, in, in which Jews are becoming a minority. And uh, if you want uh, your country to remain democratic, you cannot uh, live without a border, without the partition of the, of the land. So, um, of course, we, it was very, very important to have peace with Egypt because Egypt was our main enemy. And uh, that was done in 78, 79. But uh, the, the issue with the Palestinians uh, remained open and has remained open. So uh, the question was, how could we solve it? We, uh, Israel was against uh, talking with uh, the PLO. It was considered uh, a, a, a terrorist organization. And it is true that the PLO used terrorism, uh, sometimes awful terrorism. And uh, even did not put conditions uh, for negotiation with, uh, with the PLO because they said that, uh, I mean, the, the Israeli leadership, both right and left, 
uh, were against, uh, it was against uh, any talks with the terrorist organization and, and search for other partners uh, in Palestine, in, in, in the territories uh, themselves, but did not find such a partner, such other partners. Eventually, uh, in uh, 91, there was the Madrid conference. It was in a way imposed, not totally imposed, but in many ways imposed by the Americans uh, under Bush and, uh, and uh, Secretary uh, uh, Baker. And uh, on, on the 31st of October, 91, there was this uh, meeting, it, Shamir was the, the prime minister, and uh, he agreed uh, to participate in the meeting in Madrid, uh, which was a kind of a promise of Baker and the, and the American uh, administration to the Arab countries, that if they joined the coalition against Iraq in the first uh, Gulf War, uh, America will do whatever it can in order to uh, make uh, peace between Israel and its neighbors, including the Palestinians. But uh, the talks uh, after the Madrid conference, which took place in Washington, were dragged uh, by the parties and Israel was uh, under Shamir, uh, was not eager to get to the permanent, uh, to permanent agreements. It was more important for Shamir to show the Americans that he was ready to uh, participate in such a process rather than to really get to an agreement because every agreement has, uh, is, is, is involved with compromises and he was against any compromises. He was very hawkish. So the, the talks in, in Madrid were dragged, uh, I would say artificially. And uh, so when uh, Rabin came to power, which was June uh, 92, and promised uh, the, the electorate that in, in the course of the next six to nine months, he will have an agreement with the Palestinians. That was his most important electoral uh, promise. Uh, he and we in the, in the new cabinet uh, saw that uh, the talks in, in Washington, which were between Israel and Syria, between Israel and Lebanon, between Israel and a, a very artificial joint Jordanian-Palestinian uh, members uh, who were not uh, officially PLO, but actually they were PLO and they were PLO-oriented. So the question was, how can we uh, break this uh, situation or change this situation and get to uh, uh, talks, serious talks with the other side, with the Palestinians? And it was quite clear that if we don't talk directly to the PLO, it will be impossible to have any agreement with the, with the Palestinians. Because even those Palestinians who were inhabitants of the, uh, of the West Bank and Gaza, and as such, they could never be official members of the PLO because of our laws. They obeyed the, the PLO. And after every round in Washington, they used to go to Tunisia where, where the leadership of the PLO uh, lived uh, in exile and got the marching orders for the next round of talks from the PLO. And, and it was not a secret. I mean, the government of Israel knew it. So the idea was to get directly to the PLO and to negotiate uh, uh, with them. And, uh, and we found the, the partners uh, in the PLO who were ready to talk to us secretly in a back channel uh, in, uh, in Norway. So, the Oslo process was actually the first time in which uh, Israelis and Palestinians negotiated. At the beginning, it was kind of an informal channel, but in a few months, it became a formal channel whereby uh, the uh, Israeli officials uh, participated. And uh, in, in the course of uh, 
eight months between January 93 and August 93, uh, we had an agreement which uh, on the one hand solved uh, the outstanding uh, issues uh, which were the, the impediments in Washington, like for example, the number of the members of the Palestinian parliament and things like that. And on the other hand, it was a mutual recognition between Israel and the PLO, while the PLO accepted our main uh, demands. And so we were ready as a result of it to recognize them as the representatives of the Palestinian people. And that was an earthquake. That was really unexpected. It was secretly done. And uh, when the news broke, the world uh, was very happy that it was possible. And it was possible, uh, you know, the other day, uh, the clerk died in South Africa. And uh, the changes in South Africa also took place in the same, in the same period, against the background of the end of the Cold War things changed, the PLO understood that it did not have the backing of the Soviet Union because there was no Soviet Union anymore. And uh, so that was one of the reasons why things changed in, in different places in the world, including uh, between us and the Palestinians. Uh, but it was a very big deal, a very big deal because uh, the, the whole world was aware of the fact that there was a endless animosity between Israel and the PLO. Uh, there was nothing worse than saying to somebody, you are a PLO Nick, or something like that. And uh, suddenly uh, we have an agreement with them. And the agreement was that they will have an autonomy in the Gaza area and also in a small area uh, around Jericho, including Jericho itself as a beginning. And then that if in five years there will, there will be a, a permanent agreement uh, whereby the major issues like the settlements, the borders, Jerusalem and other things would be, uh, would be solved. And the, the point was that it was portrayed by the Americans who were not part of the process at all, like actually peacemaking. And you know, people in the world, when, Whatever you, you, you do, I mean, in, in other conflicts and in our conflict are not privy to the details. So once they saw President Clinton with Arafat and Rabin uh, hugging each other, it was enough for the world to believe that we have a peace agreement. While had they, 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 these people uh, read the the agreement itself, which was a short one, I think it was about a dozen of pages. Uh, there is nothing about, about the details of the permanent agreement, but only about the procedure towards the, the permanent agreement. And one of the reasons why there was such a frustration as a result as what, uh, of what happened later on was that people were sure that we already had peace. And then, then there was violence and terrorism, and uh, we did not get to the permanent agreement, which had to be signed by May the 4th, 99, and was never signed. So um, from then where, you know, big new things were happening and uh, this kind of agreement, this discussion for the first time was happening, um, and now where the peace process feels very much stagnant and stuck. Um, what felt possible then that doesn't feel possible now? Well, what you had then was that, uh, as I said, uh, the PLO was, uh, in, was very much challenged by the reality of the of their support for Saddam Hussein in the first uh, Gulf War. The fact that the Arab countries banished the Palestinians who worked there because of that. 
and because of the Soviet Union, which didn't exist. So all these things pushed Arafat towards a, a, an agreement with, uh, with Israel, which for him was opening the door to the United States. And usually, I mean, for many other partners of Israel, the relations with Israel is mainly in order to get to the United States. We have to admit it. Uh, it's not that we are so nice. Usually it is because we have a nice uncle. Um, now, the, the, on, the, on the Israeli side, you had Rabin, who was committed to peace with the, with the Palestinians. Uh, rather than uh, his predecessor, um, in, uh, Shamir, and uh, he uh, or, or, and uh, he, he was totally committed to the idea of uh, fulfilling his electoral promise. And you have America. You had America in America. Young President Clinton was not uh, committed to peace between Israel and Palestine. It was not on his agenda at all. Like almost every, any other uh, president in the United States, he, his advisors advised him not to touch it because anybody who, who touches the Israel and Palestine fails. Uh, so he was not involved and he was not too privy to the details of, of the conflict itself and the ways to, to solve it. But when we came to him and told him the news about this channel, uh, he was very happy because until then the, he, he did not have any, any international achievement. And uh, here we are with a kind of a gift. Now, it is true that in many ways in August 93, uh, uh, it was in his hands. What do I mean by that? He could easily have said, with all due respect, what you have here is a kind of an interim solution. You refer to the issues which will be debated towards the permanent agreement, but you don't even hint about what kind of a interim a, of a permanent agreement will it be? Will it be a Palestinian state? Will it be an autonomy forever? Whatever, when you don't say. So thank you very much for your gift. Uh, I will praise it, but uh, come to me in five years when you, you are having a permanent agreement. But he did not say so. He, 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 he is a, a very shrewd politician. And he, he did, made out of it a little bit more than what it was. I cannot say that I was against it because it was a kind of euphoria. And in Israel also, people were, were so much supportive. I mean, hawks and doves, I mean, all of them, very few people went against it. And in Palestine, Palestinians uh, uh, threw uh, uh, flowers on Israeli tanks. It was as if, you know, the, the Second World War ended. Everybody hugged everybody. Really, it was like that. Exactly. Wow. So, so uh, Clinton used this moment in order to make out of it a big, big, big deal. And it was bigger than reality. But and this so, beating of the stars, everybody had an interest to promote the idea of peace. And this is why we succeeded to have an agreement. It was very easy to insist on one of the issues and to say we don't have a partner. But this was not the case. Um, so, uh, is it the case? Is it that narrative feels quite prevalent now? This that there's no partner for peace. That there's no partner for peace. That, uh, there's no will on. There's no will on both sides. So has has that changed, or do you think that given the right steps, there there would be more will, or do you think something really fundamental has changed, and that that people are more kind of hardened now or more bitter or something like that? Well, I, I believe that there is a Palestinian partner who is committed to peace and his name is uh, President Mahmoud Abbas. 
He is a serious person. He was against the Intifada. He criticized openly Arafat for actually riding the wave of, the, of violence in 2000. And uh, I think that uh, I can understand why people were against uh, Yasser Arafat, but it's very difficult to understand why are they against uh, Abu Mazen. You, you can always quote something that he said in the past and say, you see, who do we have here? Somebody who said A, B, and C. But uh, you know, politicians talk sometimes too much and it is very easy to quote that. And sometimes they, 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 they talk nonsense. And it is not uh, unique to, to Abu Mazen. So people are, are, are uh, quoted and, uh, and he is committed. Uh, on the American side, uh, President uh, Biden is uh, very well versed, much more than his predecessors. I know him very well. And I remember talking with him when he was the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Senate. He, he had his view about the solution, which is not far from uh, the, the Israeli peace camp um, or, or the Clinton parameters of 2000 of a two-state solution based on 67 borders and so on. Uh, and and uh, if asked by the parties, I think that he will be more than happy to help, but he will not, I think, uh, initiate now something because Again, everybody tells him, don't touch it. And he has other things, uh, the domestic issues, as you know, and China and other things. Uh, but I believe that eventually the solution can come from the parties themselves. I mean, people who believe in peace and don't stick to the hollow slogan of we don't have a partner, as if when you are against partition of the land, you can have a partner on the Palestinian side. By definition, I mean, if you say, I will never give up on any part of the land, can you say that there is a Palestinian partner? Because once you say that there is a Palestinian partner and there is no Palestinian pa a partner who will give up on the Palestinian state, you are ready to compromise. So it is very simple mathematics. I mean, if you say there is no partner, you mean I'm not ready for peace. And uh, I, I think that there is a chance that uh, Israelis, Israeli leaders, even, you know, Lapidu is going to become our uh, prime minister in less than two years, already committed himself to the two-state solution. Uh, Biden is, commit, is, is repeating the idea of a two-state solution everywhere. And the same uh, uh, goes for, for Abu Mazen, of course. Uh, and still the, the two-state solution is the plural solution uh, supported by, by the Palestinians and Israelis. It is true that in the past it was the majority which supported the two-state solution and today it is only the plurality. But still there is no other solution which is more popular, not here and not there, uh, than the two-state solution. And this is why I believe that it, it shouldn't take too long before we get back to the table and talk again. Maybe we should think about some new ideas like a confederation of Israel and Palestine, which will be the umbrella of a two-state solution or something like that. But the, the core of the solution should be a two-state solution and we don't have a better one. Um, in the 90s, if uh, as as you've mentioned that Rabin was uh, committed committed to this two-state solution and there was will on both sides. Um, the question seems to be why did it not uh, outlive him? Why, why did the, why was it not, not finalized? Why was it not signed? Why did it seem to die with, with Rabin? Um, why, why did it not out, outlive the players? The characters? Well, the, the idea of the Madrid conference, which was actually the, the main organizing, organizer of the, of the process, 
Everything is written in the invitation to the Madrid Conference of 91. According to this invitation, there were the bilateral talks in Washington and also the multilateral talks on economy, on water, on refugees, uh, on uh, security arrangements uh, between, uh, among many countries in the world, 13 Arab countries, Israel and other countries. So in, in this invitation, there was a very clear, uh, uh, I would say plan for an agreement between Israel and Palestine in, in five years. So Rabin just began his, his term and was not committed to find a permanent solution beforehand. I, I had discussions with him about it and I thought that we should not wait for too long. But it was important for him to go along the Madrid lines uh, and, the, the, and the Madrid uh, trajectory. And that is what he did. Uh, so it's not that he committed himself to a permanent agreement. He, he committed himself in the elections to an agreement with the Palestinians. And that was the agreement that, that he achieved. If you ask me today, I think that he was wrong by rejecting the idea of cutting the, 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 this trajectory and, and say, okay, let's go immediately for, an, of a, for a permanent agreement rather than spending very, very problematic five years, which has not ended uh, in, in an interim ongoing solution. Um, and looking at kind of more recent um, activity in, in the kind of in the area of Israel making making peace or making changes to the situation um, from kind of from right wing actors. So I'm thinking of like the Abraham Accords, for example, and these ideas which kind of ignore the ignore the Palestinians. Really, um, do you think do you think there's well, in fact, do you, what what has the what have the Abraham Accords changed? Do you think they've changed anything with regards to the Palestinians? Uh, do you think they're helpful or unhelpful? Well, the Abraham Accords are a direct directly connected to the multilateral talks about which I told you uh, before. So. It is not something new. I mean, I, I remember myself as a deputy foreign minister, I think, uh, in 94, in, uh, in Qatar, in Oman, uh, in Morocco, in Tunisia. I mean, it was the Madrid conference and especially the Oslo process, which opened up the Arab world to Israel. Now we had, I, I negotiated the diplomatic relations with Tunisia, which were not fully diplomatic relations, but partial ones, like attaches and things like this. Um, so we had in Israel in the, in the first part of the 90s, uh, special envoys who were actually uh, high ranking di uh, diplomats from the most important Arab uh, countries. Uh, not to speak about, uh, for example, Jordan, which made peace with us as a result of the Oslo agreement. They wouldn't have done it without Oslo. And we had Egypt, which was already done by begging. Uh, and and uh, that was, as I said, the most important uh, peace treaty we ever had because Egypt had been our main threat. So we already have been there, then it stopped in the 90s with Netanyahu, because he actually stopped the, the, the Oslo process. And all these Arab countries called back their ambassadors or so-called ambassadors and the relations with them were in many ways severed, not totally. Uh, I, for example, personally used to go to Oman and, and especially Qatar, uh, even in those years. Uh, so what happened last year was that uh, actually because they, they needed America so much, 
if it is for, for airplanes, if it is for loans, if it is whatever it was, that a President Trump uh, was ready to pay in American a currency the, the demands of these Arab countries from Israel. Again, Israel was here a, a, an instrument to get to, to, to the Americans and to say to the Americans, you want us to do, to make peace with Israel? Okay, fine, but we want A, B, and C. If you ask me, I, I blessed it. I thought that it was very, very important to have this uh, uh, renewed relationship. Uh, it had nothing to do with the Palestinians. Regretfully, the Palestinians were too harsh to reject everything and to say, well, it is against us or whatever. And Netanyahu used to say, you see, I can have peace without uh, pain. A, the Americans paid. So somebody did pay. B, you are speaking about a territorial pain. Of course, with, with uh, the Gulf uh, states, you don't have any territorial uh, problems. But imagine that something like that could happen with the Palestinians. Imagine that the Palestinians would come to us and say, you know what? You are so nice as occupiers that we want you to remain in the territories forever. And we will be whatever, citizens in, in, your, in your country. I believe that Israel, if you are a Zionist, would have said, thank you very much for this gift, but we want a border, not a, a, a one state solution, because in no time we will become a minority in our uh, own country. The only way for us not to be a minority is to have a border. So what you are offering us is not a peace for peace. You are offering us to be part of Israel and to undo it as a Jewish state. So to, to portray the Abraham Accords as an invention or patent of having peace for peace without any payment is relying on the, on, on the what should I say, of the fact that people don't know too much. And it is easy to, to sell hollow, uh, uh, hollow uh, slogans uh, to to the to the people to say the the others paid a lot and I paid nothing. You know, Menachem Begin paid a price of the Sana Peninsula when he withdrew totally from from it, and the Sana Peninsula is three times bigger than Israel. So in a way, Netanyahu said he didn't say so, but this was what he meant. Begin was stupid. Why did he give so much? He could have had a peace for peace. Had I been the prime minister in 78, I would have just signed a peace treaty with the, with the Egyptians without giving them anything. Um, so yeah, because one of the kind of narratives around, yeah, around it was the, this idea that um, you know, we have we have partners in uh, in the Gulf states. We have partners. Well, we have partners. We have peace. The Palestinians don't want to be partners. They don't want to be part of it. So we'll leave them to it, and we'll make peace where we have partners. Um, and why? So why is that not the case with the Palestinians? So so with people with Abraham, you know, Netanyahu and Trump, they look at the Abraham Accords and they say well, where these states are willing partners for peace, we, we, have, we make peace with them. If the Palestinians wanted peace, we would make peace with them too, but they don't, so forget them. Well, because the Palestinians said, they, your conditions for peace are impossible for us. And they were right in that case. Not always, I think that they rejected some ideas which could have been supported by them too, like the, 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 especially the Clinton parameters of 2000. I think this was the biggest mistake of the Palestinians to reject it. Uh, but uh, they, they could not accept uh, the Abraham Accords. Uh, For example, I'll tell you one example. One of the points of the Abraham Accords 
accords, is that the Palestinians uh, who live abroad and would like to come to Israel, to, not to Israel, to Palestine, when Palestine is established, will have to get the Israeli permit for that. You understand what I'm, I'm, I'm saying? It's crazy. I mean, you may say, don't come to Israel, maybe only on a symbolic level or whatever. But to say that the new Palestinian independent and sovereign state will not be allowed to a, a right of return to the Palestinian state is something that the Palestinians could not ex accept. I mean, it is, it is crazy. And that is why, of course, you say, accept all my conditions and I will uh, be ready, but uh, you cannot put uh, uh, such a demand to the Palestinians. And I think that they were totally right by rejecting the, uh, the offer to them in the, in the Abraham Accords. They were wrong in being so anti-Gulf and anti-Morocco and anti-Sudan when uh, rather than saying, okay, Israel is ready to make peace with all these countries and all these countries are ready to make peace with Israel, so be it. But uh, you know, the most important thing for the Israelis is us, the Palestinians. And if you don't make peace with us, uh, you may, may uh, enjoy uh, Abu Dhabi or, or Dubai, but uh, your problem is not there. Um, in you've written before about um, about calling for a joint Isra Israeli and Palestinian confederation as a, as a solution. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that what that would mean, what that would look like, and why you think that why you think that um, is would be preferable to a kind of traditional to two separate states, the kind of divorce model. Well, the. The Confederation is going to be, according to my view, a very mild umbrella, meaning there will be no joint uh, institutions like government, parliament, presidency, or whatever. Each country will have its own uh, political institutions, uh, and it will be two uh, sovereign and independent uh, uh, countries. They will have a uh, advisory institutions and uh, and will deal with co coordination coordination is a must in such a small area must if you speak about agriculture if you speak about epidemics if you speak about about water if you speak about other natural resources if you speak about security if you speak about whatever so you need here a, a very high level of coordination. And the model for me is the European Union. The European Union began as a very small and, and modest organization and without knowing exactly where they were heading. And they are in the midst of a process in which they succeed to keep the sovereignty and the independence of all the countries. And the, 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 the fact that they are uh, having joint uh, organizations doesn't make these organizations um, uh, ulterior to the, uh, to, to the uh, institutions of the different states. Um, and I think that the, the, it is almost unbelievable to see what is happening with the uh, European Union if you compare it to something which happened in Europe only 75, uh, 80 years ago. I mean, to believe that uh, France and Germany would lead such an organization, regretfully Britain uh, left this organization. Uh, I think it was one of the huge mistakes of Britain in, in, in the modern history. Uh, but the, the fact that the, there are no wars in, in uh, Europe, if you, I don't count the, the Yugoslavian one, which was a disaster, but otherwise there were no wars in, in, uh, in Europe since the Second World War. 
and that the, the relations are, are so uh, normal between the parties, uh, not to speak about the economic, it is a huge market, huge market, and very influential in the world. Uh, so that the issue of, for example, permeability of the borders is something which is going to be a gradual process. If both sides understand it security-wise, it is okay. So they will open up. If not, they can be a, a harsher on, on this uh, issue. And other things, I mean, the, the idea is of, of a gradual process, which will be built in, in the agreement between the two countries. Let us say that the governments will meet every uh, five years or something like that to deal with uh, issues of liberalizing the relations between the two parties. For example, moving from a uh, customs union uh, to a free trade zone and other things. Uh, raising the issue of a Palestinian currency uh, and, and, and many other uh, issues, open Jerusalem. Um, so so the, the, and, and one of the most important things is that if there is a confederation, it will be much easier to, uh, to allow the settlers, the Israeli settlers in the West Bank to remain where they are under the Palestinian state as a residence of, uh, of Palestine, permanent residents of Palestine and citizens of Israel. And that is the same number of, of Palestinians would be allowed to live in Israel. So if you have something like that, you are uh, dealing with, I believe the most important impediment for every uh, Israeli leader, the, there is, it is an obstacle, a, a very real one, to evacuate more than 100,000 settlers from their homes. But if you say to them, it is your cho choice, if you want to uh, come to Israel, to the sovereign Israel, and to get uh, compensations, you will get it. If you want to stay, you can stay. But you will not stay in Israel. It will not be part of Israel as it is envisaged in the Abraham uh, Accords, you will be part of Palestine, and it is up to you. Um, I want to change subject, change uh, direction a little bit, um, and discuss um, Israel's relation with the rest of the world now. Um, so in the most recent escalation of violence um, in May, um, there was a huge social media campaign to delegitimize Israel and then specifically to push this idea that there's there's no conflict there's just one side oppressing the other and that's it and if if you think anything else if you think there's any any kind of two sides or any conflict about the matter then then you're just in favor of oppression etc um and this message was being pushed kind of on like on Instagram pages with more followers than all of the Jews in the world. Um, and it kind of brought the, this mess and also the message that Jews have no real relationship to Israel and brought this message to a very wide and young audience. And I want to ask you if you think that if you think that this is important, like that if you think that this message kind of being picked up by just people, people around the world more and more, is important if it makes a difference to Israel or if Israel if Israel and the Palestinians are able to kind of ignore this and how relevant you think it is? It is relevant. It is not crucial, but it is relevant. And no, no country would like to, in a democratic world would like to be in such a situation that you are always on the defense. You have to, to explain and explain and explain. Now, the big issue is that we don't have peace with the Palestinians. The smaller issues are that the events which are happening as a result of it. And for example, the issue of Gaza. We can prove that the, the Hamas was the first one who shot and they shot for the first time on Jerusalem because of, of uh, the, the conflict uh, which aroused around uh, Sheikh Jarrah uh, neighborhood. 
it was not that Israel shot at, uh, at Hamas. But I don't think that proving it is enough. I mean, the, the world will say, yeah, but there are people under uh, occupation and they have the right uh, to uh, revolt and, and, and to fight against you. And if they don't have means to get, uh, the, they don't have the, the, the ways uh, to have peace with you in other way, maybe they are allowed to do that. Hamas is not ready for peace. They don't put conditions like the PLO. If you do that and that, we will make peace with you. Then they believe that Israel is not le legitimate. And as a result of it, they don't even put, put uh, conditions for us. Go back to Europe and that's it. Um, that is quite important uh, to explain. But I believe that at the end of the day, uh, with all due respect for Hasbara for explanation, the, the big deal is to make peace. Not with Hamas, it is impossible, but with the PLO. Meaning that we will have peace only, I mean, which will be implemented uh, only in the West Bank. And then we can say to Hamas, if you don't want to have peace with Israel and you are ready only for a ceasefire, so let's have it. If you want to, to uh, join the PLO and make peace with Israel, then Gaza would be part of the Palestinian state. So again, the image of Israel is very important for Israelis. Peace with the Palestinians is much more vital. Um, that's, yeah, that's really important that peace, peace, is, peace is the priority is, is the message. Um, and in, in your political career, what's, what has changed in uh, the relations between diaspora Jews and Israel? And what's the significance of this, of this relationship? Um, why is it important? Well, if you ask me, my, my uh, Judaism is my family. I am a very secular person, and I think that I'm very Jewish. Uh, and uh, the, the, the reason why I am Jewish is mainly because I was born Jewish. Maybe I would, if I would have been born uh, whatever, uh, it, I would not uh, uh, convert to Judaism, but I'm here. And it is very important for me. And I have a very interesting people with a very unique history. And, uh, and I like it. Yes, I like my family and I want my, my family to prosper. And I don't have even to answer myself uh, the question why. It's obvious. It's my family, it's my people. Um, and uh, speaking about my people, you know, after what happened in Europe uh, 80 years ago, we don't have to explain anything. Jewish continuity is, is really something that uh, we don't have to prove its importance. And uh, I don't, don't want to lose my, my brethren. I, I uh, want my extended family to succeed. And I think that what, what is very, very important is to contain the different uh, movements, the different kind of, of people who, are, who see themselves as Jews. If people see themselves as Jews, I don't want to be in a situation in which I say, no, 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 you are not Jewish. Um, I don't think that we can afford something like this. And this is, I believe, the biggest uh, debate inside uh, the, the, the Jewish people, whether to contain phenomena, which, is not ex which are not exactly uh, reflecting the behavior of many Israelis, mainstream Israelis, who are traditionalists and, and uh, go to, uh, to uh, synagogue on, on the high holidays, but otherwise uh, don't eat kosher, you know, and all, all these things. They, they find their way 
uh, uh, but, uh, but when they see uh, the daughter of the Clintons marrying a Jew with a rabbi and, and the priest, they say, no, 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 this is, they are not Jewish. Uh, we, we are giving up on them. I don't want to give up on them. And, uh, and I think that, I mean, for me, this is the most important thing. These phenomena are happening more and more in the world. Because if we don't speak about those Jews who live in ghettos abroad, the others, even if they are a moderate religious people and, and if they are reforms and, and conservatives and, and secular, they, uh, they find themselves in the general society and they, they fall in love and, and they, are, they are having uh, non-Jewish friends and, and, and whatever. And I think that we have to, to give an answer to these people and, and to try to keep them in the tent which means to compromise. I mean, even for me as a, a, somebody who doesn't go to, to, a, to, syna to, to a synagogue, a, things like what I described before of a rabbi and a priest together in a wedding party, you know, I, I don't feel 100% with it, but the, I'm, I'm sure that the easy way is to say, if you are not 100% as me, then I don't want you, is a huge mistake. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I, I uh, created the birthright, uh, Taglit, in 94, uh, because I, I wanted Jews to meet each other, to know that this is their family to know that they can come to Israel and they don't have to make Aliyah to Israel necessarily. Of course, if they do, it's fine, but I just wanted them to, to know that there is a place in the world which is always ready to accept them when they want. They don't have to be needy or in, in under stress or, or in, in whatever. No, just if you want, you can come. If you don't want, have good relations with us. And, uh, and we are there for you. And I think that it contributed a little bit to this uh, feeling of a, an extended uh, family. And it was very, very important for me to uh, fight against those who wanted Tagli to be only for kosher Jews, kosher uh, orthodoxly. Uh, I'm saying if a student wherever in, in Sheffield is saying, I am Jewish, and it is only his father who is a Jew, not his mother. Who am I? I'm not a rabbi, thanks heaven. I, I, I should tell him, no, 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 no. Even if you love Israel and you love the Jewish people and you know much about it, if your father is Jewish, it is not enough for me. It's crazy in my view, crazy. So we allowed people to come on birthright uh, uh, trips. Uh, without, uh, you know, digging so much in their family uh, tradition and history. And I think that this is what we should do. Um, uh, it, but it kind of feels at the moment, at least what the news that I have been seeing, that um, in particularly in American, younger American Jews, less religious, are feeling more and more distance, distance from Israel. They, they feel taken up by causes uh, like of social justice and they, but, but really they say we're American Jews, you know, we have nothing to do with Israel. Um, how big a problem, in your view, how, how big a problem is this? How widespread is it? And uh, what, can, what can be done? Well, here again, I mean, for me, uh, Oslo and Birthright are in the same room because I believe that if we make peace with the Palestinians and there is a Palestinian state and there's a Jewish state and we live side by side as neighbors and as good neighbors, most of the criticism against Israel, I'm not speaking about antisemitism. This is something that I cannot explain to myself. Really, I, I really, you know, people have explanations. I, I don't have explanations, but it exists. I cannot ignore it. 
And uh, one of the good things about living in Israel is that you don't have it here. And it takes time for us who were born in Israel to understand that it is not only in the history books, but also in reality. But I think that the, if we make peace with the Palestinians, at least part of the criticism against Israel, which has aspects of anti-Semitism, although it is not the same, will not exist. So if you ask me what can be done, it is not that I believe that peace is the panacea, that it solves all the problems for the Palestinians, for us, for the, for, for the, the diaspora Jews, but it will solve a lot, a lot of issues. Oh, sorry, uh, my sound cuts out for a second. Um, shall we talk uh, quickly about a little bit about Rabin, uh, and then maybe, and then uh, we'll take questions. Um, so, so um, what was what was Rabin like as a politician, as a person? Uh, why is he considered so important? Why has he got this kind of legendary status, posthumously, kind of now in, in the history? Well, he, he was the chief of staff of the Six Day War, which was a, a legend. And he was the, the man who uh, was assassinated because he went for peace. These are the two, I would say, main uh, points in his life. He did a lot, but uh, these were the two things which made him uh, what he became uh, in history. And uh, personally, he was not a, a very easy person. He was uh, very shy on the one hand and very blunt on the other hand. And usually, you know, they don't go together. It's like oil and water, but, but this was the, the fact. I mean, he was shy and, and kind of a loner. And on the other hand, he was very blunt. Um, very bad sense of humor, very straight to the point, very pragmatic, a little bit cynical. Uh, didn't believe in big visions, but uh, in, in things that can be done and proven in a short while. Um, I, I, I think that uh, he was not the usual leader. I mean, he saw himself, like many others who came to politics out of the army, as somebody who hated politics, hated politicians, and were just there for the good of Israel, not for the good of, of the parties. I think that he did not understand what politics were, was about at least in his first term between uh, 74 and 77 in his and he was a very bad prime minister he was a good prime minister in the second term between 92 and his assassination in 95 he then opened was opened up he understood that politics means compromises that th there is a limit to your bluntness that you cannot say to everybody exactly what you did, you thought about him and or her. And uh, uh, he, he also understood that the, the importance of, of uh, making peace. I mean, things that he, he really vowed not to, to do, like talking to the PLO. Uh, eventually he was the one who, who agreed to do that. And so he changed a lot, but uh, he was not a, a simple person. Uh, he was not a nice guy, not at all. Um, don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Um, yeah, we won't. We won't tell anyone. Um, so why why does it is it true or why does it feel like it's so hard for the left now in Israel? 
and generally to produce these kind of high high caliber leaders who people can really get behind. And in fact, was Rabin like? Did Rabin feel like one of these at the time? He was. He was very uh, much. Uh, uh, under under attacks and other under criticism, uh, he was not. A, he was a leader of of half of of the of the population. The other half hated him. So. I mean, you could say something like like that. Uh, a leader who really was the the the, the one who could uh, embrace the whole nation, with of course islands of opposition, but not significant enough. Only about Ben Gurion. There was no other leader who was this on this uh, level uh, since. Uh, you see, Bibi Netanyahu was very popular and still popular, but his support is, is uh, about 30% of the people. So, and, and they support him very much, but there is hatred towards him and most of the people reject him. So I, I, uh, and I, I'm not sure that we need uh, somebody who will be supported and, and loved by everybody. Usually you have these people in time of war, like the Churchill kind of, of leaders or the Gore or something like that. It is, it is not by, by chance that Roosevelt and them uh, were so liked and appreciated uh, in, in, at war. And even Churchill was ousted, uh, ousted in, in 50. And then he was a lousy prime minister afterwards. So I, I, I would say that uh, it is not that I'm dreaming about the, the, uh, the, the leader who will be accepted by all. For me, it is fair enough if he is democratically elected, he has a coalition and he is a pragmatic person who understands what does it mean to be a Jew in the 21st century, who sees himself as one of the, uh, as part of the Jewish people, and understands that to to uh, successful Israel is that the others will not suffer, uh, that it is not a zero sum game, and that it is very important for us that not only we will succeed but also our neighbors. And for that, you don't have to be charismatic or whatever. Have you got any names? Name. Uh, there are people in the younger generation uh, who uh, I believe uh, can, can fit to this description uh, since, as, as you see, I'm not putting a very high threshold. Um, okay, thank you very, very, very much. Um, that was really interesting. And um, so I think we're gonna do it like this. If you have a question, put your hand up in the Zoom. I'll take a few at a time, um, so you'll see you can have a, a chance to rest your voice for a minute. Um, and then also, I think somebody's monitoring the chat on Facebook. So if anybody is watching on Facebook, um, if you just put a comment with your question in the chat, um, and I think it will come to us. Uh, so yeah, if, if anybody in the if anybody has a question, just uh, put your hand up. And Dana, have we got any questions from the Facebook? Ah, Yaakov, you have a question? Yes, uh, actually, I've been wanting to talk for quite some time. Um, so you spoke a lot about the PLO and how Israel should create peace. And are you still believe that it's the right thing to do? Um, although it failed time and time again. I mean, even in the Oslo Accords, so... In your own words, you said there'll be a blood test to see whether it's successful or not. 
So if people, more people died afterwards, it would be a failure in your eyes, um, which is what happened, which is also what I think is fair. <coughs> Sorry. It's very linked to why people lose faith in the left because it's failed time and time again. So every time we give terror, I mean, the Oslo Accords, it was that 1,600 Jews, I believe, that were murdered because, you know, we enabled them to. Um, things like the two-state solution, Israel is a very small country already. I don't think you should be giving away land. I mean, there's 56 or more Muslim countries at the moment in the world. So to divide Israel up, which is quite small already, I don't believe is a solution. Is that a question, Yaakov? Yes, because I want to know how he's still, um, you know, phrasing it as an accomplishment. I don't believe the Oslo Accord was an accomplishment. I see it. Like, personally, I have friends and family friends that were died in the attacks that followed it. Um, you know, there were crowds coming from Tunisia three days after the signing. So I just want to know if in your eyes it's still an accomplishment, because that's what I gathered from the speech. Okay, if we don't have other questions for the moment, um, you'll see, is it okay if I just, if I uh, pass on to you for an, to answer or to discuss? The accomplishment is not the, the result of the Oslo Agreement. The accomplishment was <clears throat> that the two national movements recognized each other. But uh, for sure, the fact that Oslo is still around after so many years and the, the Palestinian Authority and the president and the government there, all these things prove that we don't have a permanent agreement, but an interim agreement for long. And uh, this is exactly what I said, that there will be the, the blood uh, test, and the blood test uh, was very problematic. Not the numbers you quoted, it is uh, uh, more than 900 uh, people, which is a huge number, it's enough. Uh, but um, it was, as you, you know, most of, the, of, of these uh, activities, the terror uh, events were uh, made by the Hamas, not by the, by the PLO. And, uh, you also see that the rightist governments were very eager to give them uh, weapons until today. They are getting uh, weapons to us because the last thing we need is the disorder in the West Bank and uh, ourselves uh, returning to the West Bank to uh, keep order. But the point is, what is the solution? I mean, you know, for me, as I, I stressed, the, the main issue is border. When the, the idea was a Palestinian Jordanian confederation immediately after the war, I supported it. When there was the, the agreement in London in 87 between uh, uh, King Hussein and, and the Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, I wrote it. When Hussein came in 88 and said, forget about me in the West Bank, I, I leave it to the Palestinians. They remained only two, two options for us. One was to, uh, to do something unilaterally, like what Sharon did eventually in Gaza. And the other was to talk to the PLO, which uh, in, in 88 was ready to recognize Israel. So the idea that it failed and we don't have a partner, as an Israeli, I cannot accept it as, as the, the, the final uh, verdict because I need a border if I want a Jewish and democratic state. You know, there are people in Israel on the right and on the left who give, gave up on the idea of a Jewish majority. I'm not. So, if I stick to this idea of a Jewish majority, because otherwise Israel doesn't interest me. Because it is not a Jewish state. If it is not a Jewish state, I can live elsewhere. I'm not, I'm not sure that in my age, they will uh, be too happy to absorb me. But uh, theoretically, for me, Israel is important only because it is a Jewish state. Now, I, if I have to choose, between an agreement with a party, with a, 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 a partner who is not my dream. 
you think that uh, Sadat in Egypt was my dream or King ha uh, Hussein was my dream or no, they're not my dreams, but they were ready to, to, uh, to make peace with us. And uh, we decided to, to, uh, uh, to trust them, although it was not easy. And one of them uh, proved that it was difficult to trust him because he was assassinated. And, uh, and the other option is to do what Sharon did. Otherwise, there, there is no border. And I, I cannot accept it that for, for years and years, there will be no border. Israel cannot afford it. So when you say, when you criticize the Oslo agreement, and, and you, you, of course, are right in many aspects, the question is, what can we do? I'm not a pundit. I'm not sitting in the gallery and say, oh, this, this succeeded, this did not succeed. I have to give an answer. So my answer would be at the end of the day, if there is no partner, or if the partner proves to be, I don't know what, not reliable, I will support unilateralism, knowing the dangers of unilateralism, like what I see in Gaza. I didn't like what Sharon did, but at the end of the day, I supported him because I, I needed a, a border. And that, that is what I will do in the West Bank. So I'm not a, a lover of, of, of Oslo. As I said, I, I prefer the permanent agreement already then, not at another interim agreement. And the current situation is, the, the fact that Oslo is still alive is the worst thing in my view. I need a permanent agreement, I don't need Oslo. But to say that we don't have a partner, as if, if we have a partner, then somebody like Bennett would ready to, to uh, have a partition. This is not uh, a serious name. Um, Kali, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, talking to us. Honestly, it's, it's been really interesting. Um, so, hi, I'm Tali. I'm a former student at um, Sheffield. And I wanted to actually ask you something completely different. Um, it's about the role of the United States in, you know, achieving peace in the Middle East. And I, so I've been studying, um, I've been studying a lot about it. And the point is this, the US, oftentimes it comes to a rescue, its position in the Security Council of the UN it makes it easy to block resolutions against Israel. So it is very powerful, but lately um, it's, um, what is it? it um, like its position, it's, it's considered biased and it's considered as if it's always pro-Israel and it feels like it's doing more damage than good, um, if that makes sense. And especially now that obviously people are reconsidering um, the five powers, the five permanent powers of the Security Council, considering that the, the, the um, balance between the powers after the Second World War shifted completely. So people are now considering whether some of the countries in there actually belong there and maybe some other countries should now be part of it. So what I'm saying is this, Right now, the US has this privileged position and Israel has been benefiting from it. But what would happen in your opinion if, um, if these, um, I don't know how to say it, sorry, I'm, I can't think of the word, but if the um, dynamics shifted and do you think that we should rush some kind of peace process now that the US still holds the power that it does? Or are we risking to just kind of fall behind if it were to lose this great power? Well, we, we should rush for a permanent agreement because of the demographic clock. This is the main issue for us. And this is why it is so difficult for me to understand how people say, people who are Zionists, I mean, if you don't believe in a Jewish state, which is, more than legitimate. I mean, not everybody has to believe in, in, in the, the importance of having a Jewish state. But those who support the Jewish state and even are, are, are portraying themselves as nationalists and have time are those who do, I don't understand. So it is not the question of 
I mean, if you are you are putting it on the on, on the uh, situation of the United States in the Security Council and say maybe there will be a shift of, of powers, and you may be right, but it may take take two generations or three generations or five years. I don't know. But I don't want to to uh, uh, to, to be espoused to the situation of the United States in the UN or elsewhere. I need peace for myself, not for the not for the world and not for the United States. Now, the uh, the role of the of, of America is limited. For example, on September the first, nine eighty two, a President Reagan put a plan of peace between Israel and and Jordan. Israel was went out against it under begging. Jordan went as, out against it. The Palestinians went out, went out against it because they were not mentioned there. And nobody took it seriously. The American president. And you see what happened to the parameters of Clinton. And you see what happened to the roadmap of, of Bush the 43. And, and you see what happened to the Trump plan. I mean, between us and the Palestinians, not the, the, the Gulf. Because in, in the Gulf, the America pay, paid, but with the Palestinians, we had to pay. So the, the question is whether we in the region are ready to move. This is the question. Once we are ready, the Americans will kiss us and hug us, as they did with the Oslo Agreement, as they did with even the informal Geneva Initiative. They are eager to see heal peace. But they are afraid, and rightly so, that it is not enough that they are so strong. They may prove themselves supporting us during a war, God forbid. But in order to make peace, it is not enough to have America involved. And this is why I believe that the role of the Americans is important, but it is not vital. It is up to us, mainly to the peoples themselves, to the people who should shout and scream, I mean, for the Palestinians to, to fulfill the right for self-determination is very, very important. And for us to have a Jewish and democratic state is vital. So we are the ones who have to, to, to stand up and say enough is enough. Eitan, do you have a question? Hi, yeah. Uh, thanks, Yossi, for the talk. It was really good. Um, you, you talked a lot about, uh, you know, kind of having a partner for peace within the PLO and the Palestinian Authority and specifically with Abu Mazen. What would you say in terms of kind of looking at the other side of the country, looking at Gaza? How do you approach peace with what is effectively someone who is not who is never going to see us as an equal? And how do you approach peace or even demilitarization with Hamas? I don't have a simple answer for that. What I'm saying is that what we should try to do, and I'm not sure that it is possible, but they, they are saying so in Hamas, is to have a kind of a, an armistice for a long while. And to, to have peace with the, the PLO, uh, which will include Gaza, but implemented only in the West Bank at the beginning. Telling Hamas or whoever is, is dominating Gaza, you may join us tomorrow if you agree to accept the conditions of peace. If you are ready, then there will be a corridor between Gaza and the West Bank. And in Gaza, there will be the, the same kind of development or whatever that happens in the West Bank. If you don't, then let us have the, this ceasefire and and, but your, your uh, residents will look at what is happening in the West Bank. And hopefully it will be, a, I would say, attractive enough for them to put on you the pressure to join them. But I, I must admit, I don't have a simple solution for Hamas because Hamas, at least for the time being, they may change, PLO changed, other changed, we changed. But Hamas for the time being is not a part, and it is only because 
That is what they say. It's not that they say like the PLO in the, in the 80s, that they were partners, but Israel said, no, 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 you are terrorists. They don't say that they are partners. They are saying that there are no partners and they never make peace, will make peace with Israel. I, I cannot impose it on them. If I have to fight against them, I'll fight against them. If I have to wait, I will wait, but I don't want them to thwart the efforts to make peace with the PLO in the West Bank because they don't want to make peace with us. Um, if anybody else has a question, they can just put their hand up uh, in the the, uh, the the hand icon. But if that seems there seems not to be anything more, so uh, okay, I think we'll wrap up then. Um, so yeah, y Yossi, I just wanted to say on behalf of our Jewish society, um, thank you very, very much for taking the time and being so generous, um, generous in giving your time. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And, um, and Shavuot yeah. to all. Shavuot, uh, Shavuot to everybody. Um, okay, so uh, that's it, guys. <laughs>